The game of chess is separated into three parts, the opening, the middle game, and the end game. End games can be a little bit more boring and mysterious to study, but you absolutely should because they're theoretical, which means they're solved, which means that if you're winning a position, you'll know how to win it, and if you're losing, you might know how to draw it using certain tricks. In this video, I'm going to show you all the basics of rook and pawn endgames. We're going to look at a few theoretical examples, ones that have solutions and concepts already built in, and then at the end we will look at a practical example. Timestamps on the video player as always. Let's go. So, the very basic rook and pawn endgame position is one that looks like this. It's just the absolute basic, and I'm going to introduce a few terms that you're going to be hearing throughout this video. So you've got this pawn, and it wants to become a queen, and you have a rook in the way, and the king is going to walk with this pawn together to get the pawn to promote. Ideally, the rook will have to sacrifice itself for it, and you'll, will be, you'll be left with king and rook versus king, and you win the game. Um, one more thing is at play here. You gotta look at the enemy king. The enemy king is not where it needs to be, which is as close to the pawn as possible, literally in front of it, in an ideal situation. And your rook is cutting off this king. This is what this is called. This king is very far away three files away, actually, from any sort of defense. This is completely winning for white, and you would win it by going like this. King to e5, trying to push the pawn. Let's say black gives a check. Doesn't really matter where you move the king. Uh, you can move in front and then slide over. You can also go here, threatening to push. If I give you another check, notice that you've now zigzagged, and my rook cannot check you anymore. If my rook goes to somehow try to hit you from behind. This is called a backward defense, backward check. You will push your pawn. Let's say I check you. You don't want to necessarily move in front of your pawn. You can go here. I'll go here, push. And now there is a technique for me to get out, avoid getting hit by so many of your checks and winning the game. That is essentially the point. And again, your king is very, very, very far away. So this is, the, the, this is the absolute basic understanding of what this video is all about and why it's important, because some of these things are a little bit harder than others. And the very first position we are going to look at has the king very close to our pawn and our king and, and everything like that, right? So here you are pushing the pawn forward, your king is moving forward, but it's black's move. And this position for black is a draw. This one is known as the Philidor defense. And what Philidor defense means is black needs to defend the sixth rank. If you are defending on the opposite side, like you are playing with the white pieces, it would be the third rank. But in general, two ranks away from promotion. Black here plays the move rook to a6. Why? Because now the king cannot get, oops, sorry, the king cannot get closer. And essentially what black wants, black doesn't care about checks because the king can shuffle back and forth as long as the rook is moving like that. If the pawn goes forward, to create a shield for the king, because then you will check and potentially mate the enemy king. Oh, this happened? Okay, great, let's go all the way down. Because now the white king cannot hide from the checks. If the white king comes closer, you have a backward check. Right? You have a backward check. You keep checking, and that's it. The king's got no shelter. And the second the king starts to, starts to drift and run over that way, I mean, you can continue to check me if you want. At a certain moment, you can go back and just target the pawn because it's impossible to defend it if the king wanders too far in the distance. Rook to a6 is a draw. Okay, and you need to play this move. I mean, this is the easiest way to draw, 6th rank or 3rd rank defense. Uh, but one more thing about this kind of position is that you notice black's king and rook are on the back rank. And actually, depending on where the, the pawn is, you can just put your king and rook on the back rank, and it doesn't really actually matter about Philidor. But uh, it's not always so simple. So here, here's the thing. Back rank defense, just putting your king and rook on the back rank like this, king in front of the pawn, is a draw if the pawn is AB or GH. Okay, so if it's AB or GH, you can just go back to the back rank, and you don't have to worry. In this case, it's not. It's an F pawn. So why is this not a draw if you just do back rank defense? Like, let's say black goes, okay, no Philidor. Just going to hang out on the back rank. It doesn't matter. Okay, King G6. Okay, it doesn't matter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go here. Okay, F6. Doesn't matter. Back rank defense. How are you ever promoting? I mean, 
There is a little technique here for white. Check. Okay. Let's say king, king, I mean, it doesn't really matter. Let's say king to h8. Check again. King goes here. And now we use this pawn to check. And we win like this. And we win. Game's over. Of course, we, we win the rook. We make a queen. You know how to do ladder checkmate. Not teaching you that in this video. But that's the point. However, notice if we go back just a couple moves. Like, let's say this position. And I edit the position to be like this. This technique doesn't work for white. There, this technique just simply doesn't exist in this position. Because if you give a check, you don't, you don't have an extra file. And if you go g7 now going for this, you actually lose the game. Because black checks you, you lose your rook, you lose your pawn, you lose. So, you know, it, it, it really matters. a, b, g, h are the correct pawns to use back rank defense. However, if you don't want to, sixth rank defense is known as Philidor. The pawn cannot cross, and if the pawn does cross, you jump all the way down to the corner and you give checks from the back, okay? Great. But in this example, the king was in front of the pawn. Here is an example where our king or the defensive king is cut off. In this case, it's only cut off by one rank, so, it, 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 okay, it's not like the end of the world, but the white king has managed to zigzag, zigzag, and get in front. And the pawn is one score away from promotion. Now, at this moment, the king cannot move anywhere. So, the, the pawn is not moving forward. But this is called now the Lucina position. L-U-C-E-N-A. I should have put it in, like, down there instead of white and black. But whatever. I didn't do that. Lucina position. In the Lucina position, white has a technique to get the king out, and then promote a pawn. And what white does here is white gives a check first. This king has to make a difficult decision. If the king stays as close to the pawn as possible, we just slide our king over, and there's no check. There's no check. We make a queen. We win the game. All right? Doesn't even, doesn't matter if we lose our pawn, because we're going to win the rook. Okay, great. But what if the king doesn't do that? What if the king goes here? Well, now you have to know the technique. You can't just like go running with your king. What you need to do now is something called building a bridge. Your king is going to zigzag away from checks. And at a certain point, your rook will cover the checks. If you just go running now and you try to zigzag, check, check, look what happens. You can't keep zigzagging because your pawn has no guard. You got to go back and then I check you and then... We repeat this whole process. But wouldn't it be nice if your rook could be prepared to shield? Well, that is why in this position, you put your rook on the fourth rank. If you're playing on the other side, you put your rook on that fourth rank, which would be the fifth rank. And you anticipate that, for example, something like rook g2. Now it's time to run. Zig. Zag. Ah, and rook comes to f4. Boom. And that's it. And you've won. You use the check to deflect the king away by one rank Put your rook up, and then you use the rook as a shield for your king. Now, there's one bonus example here. Let's say you play rook to d4. Actually, let's back up. Let's say king came a little bit more actively. So you play rook d4, but now king c5. Now, hold, hold on a second. You can't just go running. Well, you can't go running, but you can play rook to f4. And this is a big problem, because now your rook is just escorting your pawn. This rook cannot prevent the king from running in both directions. So if the king goes back to try to get closer, um, there's, you know, king to e8, for example. And there's even positions like, okay, they attack your rook, but in time to promote, defend your rook, and you win. So that is the Lucina position. However, the Lucina position is not always winning. This is a technique that is, you know, important to know how to build the bridge, rook up, and then zigzag. But sometimes you get games like this. It, I mean, it looks like Lucina, but it depends whose move it is. If it's black's move, this is something called side checks. There's a lot of different ways of defending. We saw backwards checks earlier. Sometimes you have side checks. In this case, rook a8, king d7, and rook a7, and you, you, know, you can't do anything about this. If the white rook was closer, potentially you can block. But there are certain examples, you know, if, if we go to this position, but we change it, it's now white to move. White is, of course, winning. Because you can do Lucina. You can do rook g1. And, you know, wherever the king goes, you can 
put your rook in front of your pawn and then escort the pawn. Just move your king and you win. So it really depends. I mean, Lucina, it, it's, it's a very theoretical position. It's good to know, but at the end we will look at a more practical example where this kind of stuff is important. And by the way, I just want to kind of show how the Lucina position could even happen. Here you go. Here's like the beginning of a rook endgame. You know, white plays king g4. Notice white is not even pushing the pawn necessarily. White is escorting the, the king first. Black defense, pushing the pawn, you bring your king. You're not even pushing your pawn yet. You're bringing your king. It's, it's most important is the king getting all the way there, right? You think, oh, I'm just going to run my pawn. Not so fast. King goes first. Rook g8 check, king goes that way. Why that way? Well, because if you go in front of the pawn, I just check you. And then I'm going to win your pawn. So you actually have to outflank. You have to go to h6 first. Guard your pawn. And then when I start bringing my king closer, king to g7, my rook tries to stay in front of the pawn, but king g6. Rook goes all the way back, now f5. King attacks the rook, rook slides back, continuing to cut the king off. And use this same process to get this position. Right, so that is how it's more practical. I can just set up a position for you, but you go, Levy, how, how does that even happen? I, I need to, you know, be 20 moves ago to even understand how to get to this position. That's why I'm including it. Now, there is an entire chapter of endgames with a rook pawn. So, A, H. Uh, for the aggressive side, it's better to have the rook behind the pawn. We've seen that already. The rook behind the pawn, pushing the pawn forward is better, but sometimes your rook gets stuck in front of your pawn. White is moving this way. Now, in this position, if white plays the move a7, white cannot move this rook. Because anywhere that rook moves, the pawn gets taken. I mean, even if you give a check. If you check me and then I go here, you can't promote. Now, for the black king, it's important to avoid getting checked in these kinds of positions. So do not go like this. Because you get checked and then I promote. And there's one more thing. Do not chase the pawn. Because there is a famous trick. I fell for this once when I was like 8 years old. You think you're going to go win this pawn. But white just plays rook to h8. I don't even necessarily have to check you. I can sacrifice my pawn. But if I've created enough distance, I can skewer your king to the rook. And you lose the game. So for black, the best thing here is to literally do nothing. You go bup, 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 along the A-file. And the second I start bringing my king, you start checking me from the, from the back. And my king, where's my king going to hide? My king is just in the, in, in the open. My king has nowhere to hide. So, sometimes you get endgames like this, where the white king wants to go over here and hide in front of the pawn. That is what white wants to do. Hide in front of the pawn, bring out the rook, push the pawn, win the game. So for end games like this, rather than pushing, let's say you're just playing this kind of end game, Black has a technique here, and this is the third name of the video. It's called Vancura. It's the coolest one in my opinion. V-A-N-C-U-R-A. -A, Vancura position. And Vancura position is basically this rook will land on that square opposite the pawn. Horizontal vision on the pawn. It will not let me move because this will be under fire. And if the pawn pushes, then my rook will slide there to the magic square. And that will be the draw. That looks something like this. Let's say black plays rook a1. White starts marching the king in order to get over here. You can give a check. And then you can get the rook to f6. And that's it. This is just a draw. There's nothing here. It doesn't matter if the king goes to d5. I mean, you can go rook b6, rook f6. For example, something like this. And then the second the king gets close, you can, you know, you can start giving the, the, the checks. I mean, there's, there, there's just no way for me to hide here. I cannot hide from the checks. I can move around a million times. Doesn't matter. You keep giving checks. So you, you get the, the rook to this kind of magic square where it pressures. And you defend. Now, in terms of defending these positions also from position like this. Let's say here it's white to move. If it's black to move, how does black draw? Have you been paying attention? How does black draw this? Black just plays Philidor. Six rank defense. But let's say it's white's move, right? It's white's move, white plays king to g6. Wants to go here. Do you give a check? No, because then you lose. You've now failed. The Philidor position doesn't work. You failed. 
You're too slow to go to the back rank and give me backward checks because I'm mating you. So in these positions, you have to give... I mean, Rook G1 check is not awful, but it's a little bit more risky. In general, it's better to have at least vision on the pawn. But let's say King F6. And I'm threatening checkmate to the king. Okay? Now, if you've made it this far in the video, and hopefully you didn't lose your patience because you were like, this is too hard. When there is a pawn on the board in Rook and Pawn Endgames, there is something called a short side and a long side. Wherever less squares are, that is the short side. This is the short side. This is the long side. All right? Long side, you want your rook there. Short side, you want your king. Because the king keeps distance to the pawn. And the rook can give checks from, from the side if it ever has to. So the black king has to move to avoid getting mated, right? How is the black king going to do that? You're going to go to the long side or short side? Short side. Go to the long side. This is what happens. I give you a check. King to d7. I put my rook in front of my pawn. And then I go for Lucina. That's what happens. I'm going to push my pawn, zigzag with my king, and get Lucina position. So you need to go to short side. You say, Levy, well, who cares? You give me a check here, and then here again. Then do the same process. Yeah, but now you got long side checks. See, that's the difference. If the rook can keep a distance and not get under attack, the game is just is a draw. Um, and, you know, for example, rook to e8, like trying to shield from long checks. Okay, I mean, first of all, you can still give the check, but even a move like rook f1, for example, you know, you're, you're fine. In, in, in these positions, like, it's just a draw. Just don't blunder a check which trades your rooks, please. You cannot get your rook traded into a losing king in pawn endgame. You need to keep your rook on the board in the right way. Short side defense is the way to draw. The truth is, it's important to know these endgames because they'll make you more confident. They'll make you more confident in winning them and also getting to the right, you know, holding situation. But in reality, most endgames look something like this. And we will end with this example um, think about rook and pawn endgames. Activity of your king and rook, insanely important. What is your rook targeting? Isolating your opponent's weaknesses, right? Isolated pawns, for example, and finding ways to pressure them. Preventing your opponent from getting activity and not creating too many weaknesses. The endgame is a balanced process. Yes, you can have a theoretical win like the ones that I just showed you. They're incredibly important. But you have to understand how to play this too, how to not rush, how to be patient, how to maximize your pressure. So we'll end with this example. The best move for white here is to either bring the king to a more active square or rook c5. And what does this do? It prevents the opponent from moving anything forward and the rook prepares at any moment to transfer to a5, exerting pressure on this pawn. You'll notice also material is equal in this game. You'll notice that in, throughout this whole video, it's rook and pawn. It's not rook and four pawns versus rook. I don't have to make a video about rook and four pawns versus rook. If you can't win rook and four pawns versus rook, it might be time for checkers. So rook goes to c5, black plays king f8, and we play king e2, king e7, and we're all bringing our kings, right? Now white plays rook to a5, pressuring this. Black chooses to play rook to a8. I mean, black could sacrifice the a pawn for activity, but that's a, you know, that's a risky decision. Black decides to go here, and now black wants this. So we play king to d4, maximum king activity, maximum rook activity, and then locking in the bind. So we play the move b4, right? Black plays rook to b8, and we defend our pawn. We're using our pawn as a structure, right? Black has a problem here. This, rook, this pawn is now hanging, and this pawn is no longer hanging, so black can either go here or here. Black chooses rook a8. Black could go to b6, but then the rook can never move. Right, so black plays rook a8 instead, because okay, at least I can go here. Now white continues to expand. White plays e4. Pawn trades and endgames are very tricky, but in this case it's advantageous because it leaves black with two horrible pawns. And our king is more active, and our king can go walk over here. This is an endgame concept called two weaknesses, okay? Two weaknesses. Rook to a7. King to f4. All right, we're heading over here, maybe. Create some havoc with the pawns as well. h6, h4, king e6, king g4. Rook king 8 black can't do anything. And now the key move, h5. And what this does is it isolates these weaknesses. If g takes h5, king h5, how do you guard both? You can't. You, you can't. And then I'm going to escort my pawn. 
So black plays g5, g3, and now it's time to bring our king back to the middle because black can't do anything. Rook a7, and now we're ready for infiltration to the second weakness. This is the second weakness. This is a weakness potentially too. Check, infiltration. There's nothing black can do here. Black cannot stop us coming in this way if we want. Not right now, the rook is there. Or this way. Black can't stop us. Black tries to break out with c5, check. King e7 here would have prevented us from taking this pawn. But then we have rook to h8. Remember that trick from a long time ago? This little x-ray trick? It exists here too. It's why these patterns overlap. But the game ended with... Oh, I apologize. I just clicked the forward arrow. King to c6 is how this game ended. And black sacrificed the c-pawn, thinking, okay, you know, maybe I can create a little bit of activity, but rook e5. And that's kind of like much more practical example of endgames is you're not thinking Lucina, 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 Lucina. You're thinking, I'm up a pawn. I can simplify into a winning king and pawn endgame. Rook endgames take a lifetime to master, but... The more practical application of a rook endgame, of course, material matters. Rook activity, targeting a weakness, active king, right? Not isolating any of your pawns for infiltration for your opponent, shutting down their activity, and playing a balanced board. You'll notice that in this endgame, white moved the king and the rook, white moved the queen side pawns, white moved the king side pawns. You move everything. You don't just rush your pawns down the board. And hopefully this gives you a good understanding of how to play rook and pawn endgames. It, like I said, they take so much time to practice. In reality, I could make a whole masterclass about this probably. But what you have to do now is I've included a link in the description to a big, big, big detailed uh, Wikipedia page, which has a lot of examples, a lot of practical and nuanced examples where rook on one square is a draw, but rook on another square, literally one square to the right is a loss. Go ahead and, 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 and dig into this stuff. It's not the most interesting thing in the world. It's much more interesting to play a fried liver attack and win a queen in seven moves. But this understanding of chess endgames and why I made the entire chess endgame playlist is because you need this kind of foundation. Uh, think of it like a barrel. You pour water into the barrel of knowledge, but if you have holes at the bottom, information is just going to flow out, right? And if your endgames are weak, you will not know how to transition a strong opening or middle game into a winning endgame. Whereas if you're confident in your endgames and you know how to play them and you don't feel just lost in the woods in the battlefield, you'll be a lot more comfortable transitioning a game where you're up a pawn or up a knight for a couple pawns or even in an equal position into an endgame situation. So hopefully you enjoy. Check out some of my other videos in the endgame playlist or tactics or openings or gameplay. Uh, and uh, if there's anything that I haven't covered in a video, let me know in the comments below. I'll see you in the next one.